Yeah, um, okay, so Sabrina and I are going to present to you today the journey that e-receipts have gone through to get to where we are today. Um, so firstly, on the first day of our new business ventures class, I presented um, a problem that I had in my life to the class. So let me ask a question. How many of you guys find that you that losing receipts is a problem in your life? You're not alone. Um, so we interviewed 100 customers and 8 out of 10 of these customers uh, say that losing receipts is a problem in their life. So um, the problem is losing receipts and the reason that this is a problem is that customers either um, are not allowed to return the item as the retailers, it's against their policy, or else the retailer allow uh, customers to exchange it for something else in store. So customers found that they were impulse buying just to carry out the exchange. So essentially customers are losing money over this problem. So the struggle is real. So um, we have a group of six of us to uh, solve this problem. So we have Severin from Germany, then we have Lisa, Kerry and Aileen from Ireland and Anne from France. So the next step was our customer interviews. So we validated three segments um, from our interviews. So our first segment was the 17 to 24 year old females. So uh, this is a major problem amongst this demographic. So a key quote we got from one of our interviews was, I rarely take care of receipts for clothes, but every time I lose a receipt, I am very disappointed. So the main items that this uh, age group are returning are clothes and shoes, and um, they're in the medium price range, so that would be the likes of Topshop, River Island and Pennies. So the second um, segment we validated was our professional segment. So this was a medium to high problem for this segment. So a key quote was, keeping track of work expenses and managing receipts is quite a stressful task. So the key findings from this segment was that uh, they were concerned about losing work-related receipts and they had a fear of losing money as they would be unable to reclaim their expenses if they didn't have the receipt. So the final se uh, segment that we validated was the valuable segment. So losing receipts was a medium to low problem for this segment. So a quote that we got from one of our interviews was, I mostly keep the receipts for, from expensive purchases in a folder. This is not an ideal method and the receipt is easy to lose and there is no backup. So the key findings from this segment was um, when you buy high priced items, you're more likely going to uh, be more careful with your receipt. And then they all have semi-structured methods put in place, so they'll keep them in a folder or in a drawer. So I'm now going to pass you on to Severin. Thank you very much, Lynn. So we initially, after um, evaluating these customer segments, we uh, planned a cash register solution. So basically that the retailers install an, an e-receipt software on their point of sale system, which allows them to forward a digital copy of the receipt to the customer's email inbox. However, all of this changed when we met our uh, most interesting customer. And this was when we conducted our retail interviews. So we reached out to about 30 to 40 um, retailers via LinkedIn uh, to ask them for interviews. We just got back a handful um, of responses, but they were pretty interesting. So one of the responses was, for example, here from John. He's head of retail operation at Charles Turbot in the UK. And he basically wrote me, this is just an excerpt from the uh, LinkedIn message, that we might, uh, with this solution, we might be as much as uh, three years too late and that I've been using another um, e-receipts provider called uh, Y-Receipts um, for two years now, and they're about to take over market leadership. And he said that in less than a year, most of the standard point-of-sale uh, point system uh, will have it as a standard. So this was actually the moment when we decided to pivot our offering, to go from a B2B solution where we price the retailers to a do-it-yourself consumer solution with a mobile app. With regards to that, I would like to say that uh, we changed our strategy, but we di didn't change our overall uh, overarching vision of digitizing receipts, so we still had this in, uh, in the back of our mind. Um, subsequently, we came up with some uh, MVP mockups, so we developed a minimum viable product, which we would like to show you now in the following video.
thank you very much for watching. I just want to wrap up our presentation with the top three lessons we've learned over the past three months. Lesson number one. So how to get started. Uh, as a founder, you need to acknowledge that every idea is just a hypothesis in the beginning. And hypothesis is just a fancy word for an educated guess. So in order to validate the guess, you need to get out of the building, talk to customers, and invalidate uh, the hypothesis which are wrong from your business model. The second one, I've mentioned that before, um, is that a change in strategy is possible without a change in vision. So we changed our entire business model, we pivoted around our business model, but we still had the vision of digitizing receipts uh, in the back of our heads and still kept that. And the third one is about founding a startup. So before starting this class, we basically thought that uh, founding a startup is a very linear journey. It's a five-step plan, you have a brilliant idea in the, in the beginning, and you ultimately become successful if you just follow the right steps. But what we learned uh, is that it's a very iterative and very messy journey and it's more similar to a roller co coaster ride with some ups and many, many lows. So you basically start with your idea, which is just a hypothesis. You go through all the customer development process until you get to problem solution fit, but this means you're just halfway through. So you still need to get until product market fit and scale a startup. All right. If somebody asked us um, to, to narrow down uh, these three key learnings to just one sentence, it would probably be fail fast to succeed sooner, and this is the most crucial takeaway for our group from, from this module. So I want to say thank you very much for your uh, time and attention, and open the floor for some subsequent Q&A. Thank you. Thank you First question. What additional value do I get with the professional um, to just 10x increase the 10x that you can directly forward um, your, your, your work spendings um, to the financial department and you don't have to take care of um, handing in the receipts from, from your work travels. Um, I would say brilliant presentation, it's very impressive. Um, I have a question. In the uh, in mail that you put up, it was so insightful and you really went with the fact that um, that he's using another competitor. But what about the fact that he's also mean that the receipts are becoming obsolete and it's a massive issue say, for this idea because if the receipt becomes digital, um, will, will there still be the problem there to, to keep the receipt? So I'm wondering, from a consumer perspective, could there be an added value here that even when receipts are digitalized, that it still has, holds a huge value, whether it's you know, some sort of financial planning or something else there? And on stages, do you think you could add value when it becomes obsolete? So, yeah, so um, we haven't developed the idea so far, but I could definitely imagine that um, we develop some kind of solution where the receipt is directly being pushed into the app. So uh, when the paper uh, receipt gets maybe gets obsolete in five or ten years, this could be an option for, for, the, for, the, for the end. I think there was one quite, yeah, question. Okay. Just maybe, so uh, that response from the B2B customer was by email. Do you, do you think there was a missed opportunity in, in, in not doing a face-to-face -face conversation with that person and exploring further the challenges they might have around receipts? Mm, yeah, that's def definitely a problem that we just, just were in touch with him by LinkedIn. But I think he, he made his message very clear that he's, he's not interested in it because he said, well, it works perfectly fine on, on our cash registers and there's just no need for us. Um, <coughs> to implement another solution. Which market segment would you concentrate on first? Um, probably because we had the thing. Oh, yeah. um, the, we found that the females, well actually no, if we have to make money we're obviously going to try and um, concentrate on the expenses. Uh, but our, yeah, the big issue was the 17 to 24 year old female segment because they are like constantly going shopping uh, according to our interviews that um, we'd be really focusing on them, but then as well as that, focusing on the, um, the professional segment. Okay, so I was just wondering how many females are at the cash register and anywhere and say, I have to make sure I record this receipt, just in case I bring back this product in four weeks, as opposed to somebody who is, has to put in their expenses every month in order to get the cash out of business for, let's say, the expenses incurred. Uh, so one is like, may happen, which is your AWARE example, and the other one is will happen, i.e. I have to put in my expenses every month. We did find that the working professionals are probably our most valuable segment, but it's just because out of the interviews, nearly all females, 17 to 24, lose their receipts all the time, and they are they're the ones that are going back to return.
return. So they are finding it the most problem in going back and having overseas and having to kind of exchange impulsively. So we probably would mainly focus in on working professionals, but we do know that there is a problem there with the younger females. Okay, so S Steve Lang would say that you should aim for a person who's cobbled together an interim solution. So who has the interim solution? Probably it's the um, uh, uh, like professional at, at work because uh, they mostly just just make photos of their receipts or just have a cam scanner app which which has a similar offering but is way more uh, complex in, in in terms of user interface and so on. So they could be maybe the early adopter for the app. But in terms of pain point, what Kerry just said, um, the young young consumers between 17 and 24 they buy a lot of um, medium price items where there's a high turnover with. Um, just exchanges, so we, we basically came across the fact that 25% um, of all items young girls in that age group buy are being returned. <coughs> well, did, did that, when you interviewed a bigger retailer, did you get to even say someone like Rio Bro in their top shop? Did they actually want people to keep receipts? So if you look at people, especially, especially those manufacturers, like the quality is not at the top end and then it breaks and you bring it back. Yeah. I've had experience with Red Run and then also uh, where a shoe actually gives you a year receipt and they don't, they don't mind. Whereas, uh, like any time they happen on the receipt, they've always had a massive problem with it. But they did, they, I, pres I presume some of them actually wouldn't want it in that mm -hmm. quality space. Yeah. Percent. That was definitely, like, that's why we did focus on retailers because we went like done Rome and everything. And first of all, loads of managers didn't have time to talk to us. Um, and they're like, oh, it's too much of a change, like, it involved. Like training and changing our system, like they weren't like interested in what we were like offering. So that's why we really chain and focus on the customer aspect and not the retailer aspect. That's why. Cool. Thanks, Mel.